Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Wonderful. What a beautiful room. Thank you, Scott, for the introduction. Thank you, Arabian Business, for organizing this. Thank you for bringing us all together, despite the times we're in, for a live event. I'm so happy to be in a live room again and not in a Zoom room. Thank you all for coming here. As Scott said, I will share with you today some negotiation techniques that can help you after the pitch. So you've done the pitch, you warmed up an investor, somebody wants to invest in you, and that's where the negotiation starts. So before I start, I want to know who I'm talking to. So can you please raise your hand if you are a startup, if you created the comp oh wow. As Scott said, I also have tremendous respect for entrepreneurs who create something out of nothing. Now, can you raise your hand if you are an investor? If you've invested in companies, if you're interested in investing in companies. Okay, so we have both in the room, which is fantastic because the skills I'm gonna share with you is gonna help us bring both together. Now, the last question, please raise your hand if you love to negotiate. <laughs> So that's about a third of the room. That means two thirds doesn't like to negotiate. And that is the majority of people everywhere. Now the question is why? So I would like to know from a few people, can we have the mic please? Who doesn't like to negotiate and why? Uh, hi, I'm Bobby. Uh, hi Bobby. I don't like to negotiate because I always feel like there's all this unsaid stuff on both sides of the table and you never quite know if they're trusting you or if you should trust them. Right. Thank you. Exactly. There's a lot of uncertainty. And what is behind uncertainty often, Bobby, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is fear, right? Fear of the unknown, fear of what are they thinking, fear of what, what are they going to say, what are they going to think of me? And, and I want to give you skills today to get rid of that fear, okay? So at the end of the session, I'm going to ask you again, who loves to negotiate? And we're going to have more hands up, all right? Is that a deal? It's a non-negotiable deal. All right, let's get to this. I'll tell you in a nutshell my background, what I do, what I've learned, and then share with you the skills that can help in your startup negotiations and in any business negotiations, really. So my background is in finance and business negotiation. I've spent 15 years on trading floors of investment bank, the stock exchange, where I was mainly dealing with sales strategy. So the negotiations I handled were corporate negotiations, contracts, business negotiations. And while I was there, I was fortunate enough to work for a company that invested a lot in corporate training. And they brought in two professional negotiators to give us a year long masterclass on negotiations. And these are some of the world's best negotiators who taught me and my colleagues everything we needed to know about deal making, about lie detection, about profiling, all those things, human behavior. Um, and their background was in hostage negotiation. So it was fascinating to learn from them. And I remember sitting in a room like this, looking at them while they were teaching us and thinking, I want to do what you do. Fast forward a few years, I joined them. My partners now from the ADN Group, which is an international negotiation company, and we help companies with their complex negotiation. We help government institutions, any type of crisis negotiations, that's where we come in. So it can be hostage negotiation, suicide negotiations, but also business negotiations, M&A, IPOs, everything with high stakes, that's where we come in. And today I'm also fortunate to share that knowledge. Um, I give trainings, talks like this, but also uh, I have a podcast where I talk to some of the world's best negotiators. Yesterday I uh, launched an episode with Chris Voss, Chris Voss is a former FBI hostage negotiator who is doing a great job in spreading the skills of negotiation and teaching people that whether we want it or not, whether we realize it or not, we all negotiate every single day. Now, having learned a lot from them, having learned so much on the field of doing this now, 
I came up with some of the stuff that I think are the most impactful, that when you implement those, negotiations really take another turn, and we can, um, it might sound cheesy, but I don't care. I truly believe that we make the world a better place when we negotiate better. We make it a world with less conflict, with more collaboration, with more agreements, and that is why I'm so passionate about sharing this, because if everybody would apply the negotiation skills that the FBI applies, I promise you we would have a much, much, much better world. Now, let's jump right into it. Why do I like to learn from hostage negotiators so much? Well, as we all know, the stakes are extremely high when they are negotiating, right? We are literally talking about life or death. We're literally talking about human lives. One mistake, one error can get somebody killed. So how do they do it? Another thing is, although they have, of course, the SWAT team and the guns and they can barricade a door and everything, the main weapon they use is their words. That is the way they resolve conflict. Now, a quick guess. How high do you think the success rate is of hostage negotiators? What is the percentage of success when they are negotiating a deal without fatalities? Give me a wild guess. Less than? More than 90%? Who agrees, who disagrees? 70? 50. Hostage negotiators succeed without any fatalities by using their words in 95% of the cases. In 95%. So then the question is, how do they do it? What do they apply? The same things that they apply that I'm going to share with you now, I apply every single day when we're doing business negotiations. It works. Ready? Number one, obviously, is preparation. Where hostage negotiators are called in, despite all the training that they've had, they only have time to prepare from the second they jump in their car until they get on the scene. That's not much preparation time. We've seen with um, the people who were presenting previously, you have time to prepare. You have time to prepare your pitch, you have time to prepare your story, so use it. This is a main advantage that other negotiators don't always have, although they have to succeed. And when you're preparing the story, the pitch, the slides, that's all great, but I want you to go deeper and say, number one, why? Am I negotiating? If your answer is to get money, go deeper. Why are you really negotiating? Why are you there? What is the goal of that negotiation? And hang on to that, because that is what will serve you to understand your non-negotiables, your walk-away point, and everything that is important to keep you more calm, more relaxed, more authentic, and less stressed. Then super crucial, and I see many people don't do this in the preparation phase, is who are you negotiating with? Who are you sitting across and what matters to them? Of course, it's nice to know the name, the title, the company they represent, but who are they really? And what is the need that they are trying to satisfy? And again, if you think, oh, he or she wants to invest to make money, dig deeper. Because as startups, you might watch a YouTube uh, story on how to pitch for investors, right? Now, I'm here to invite you to do the opposite, to really go and stand in the shoes of the investor and Google, maybe, how to select the best company to invest in. Which startup should I invest in? Think like them, because when you start thinking like your counterpart, you will start talking like your counterpart, and you will speak the same language, and that is what will connect you. And then, of course, the what. Many people go into a negotiation without 
understanding what they're really, really negotiating. So of course you're negotiating for money, of course you're negotiating for funding, but what about all the other details? What about all the important stuff? Because what is the most effective way of resolving a conflict? The most effective way is to prevent it, right? Why would you resolve a conflict if you don't have to have the conflict? And the whole idea of negotiating up front is to negotiate and agree on all the things that might become a conflict in the future. And this goes very much into detail. When you're negotiating with a potential partner, you also have to think about um, the exit strategy. How are they going to leave? Um, all the corporate governance. What is important once you have an agreement for the future? And all those things we need to think about before we go on a negotiation table. If you know your part, you will be less surprised by what they want. So do your homework, prepare as much as you can. This is a big advantage that you have that hostage negotiators don't have. So let's use that, all right? Next, you want to understand what the situation is really about. Now, what does WTF stand for? Who said that? No, it doesn't stand for what you think it stands for. You see, when we negotiate, we want to understand what the situation really is. We want to understand the market, we want to understand the person we're negotiating with, but what we truly, really, really want to understand is what is the need that they're trying to satisfy. And now here I am again telling you something that might sound very counterintuitive, but never negotiate on what somebody says they want. It doesn't matter. When I go into a negotiation and my counterpart tells me what they want, I don't even write it down. I specifically don't repeat it back. I don't want to anchor that because what they say they want doesn't matter. Now, how's that, you might think? You know, the number one mistake people make when they negotiate is they negotiate on the ask. Somebody says they want something and you start negotiating on it. Now, if you want to be a good negotiator, an impactful negotiator, you don't negotiate on what somebody says they want, but you try to understand what do they believe is obtainable. You try to understand their objective, the what are they thinking, what do they believe is realistic. Now, we're not here to be good negotiators, we're here to be great negotiators. So if you want to be a great negotiator, you don't stop there either. You keep digging and you dig further to understand what do they need. Not what they say they want, not what they think they can obtain. What do they need? What is the need? Because the need is the non-negotiable. And more often than not, the need has an emotional element. So when you hit that, that's when you know this is party time. Because once you understand the need, all of a sudden there are so many possibilities to satisfy that need without necessarily satisfying the ask. Does that make sense? Yep, wonderful. So a very simple way to remember this is always analyze the WTF of the situation of your counterpart, where WTF stands for W for words, this is what they say they want, this is what you hear, this is what they write in an email, this is the proposal, everything that is expressed. We don't care about that. Forget about it. Don't even write it down. Forget about it. It's just a detail. It's just the beginning point. Don't be impressed by it. We're going to dig, 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 and I will give you the tools on how to do that to understand what are they thinking. What are the thoughts? What do they believe is obtainable? 
And as we're here to be excellent negotiators, we're going to dig even further. This will make you stand out from most of the negotiators out there and try to understand the F word, which is feelings. So WTF before you go into a negotiation, okay? Now, let's say you understood the need of a negotiator, the need of an investor, the needs, your own needs. That's when we connect the dots and we come to a common ground. So since we're here with both negotiators and investors in the same room, I think it's a beautiful opportunity to talk about these needs upfront so that you have an idea of what matters to the other party? What can matter to the other party? Okay, so I want to know from the startup first, think about your needs. When you're pitching your company, when you're negotiating for money, what else are you negotiating for? What is your need besides money? Money is fine. Okay, what else? I want to hear from you. The startups. Sorry, we need the mic, I don't hear you. Network. Network, okay. What else? Mentorship. What else? Perhaps we would be looking for uh, partners that share the same vision or yeah, can help achieving it. Somebody who has the same vision to achieve your dreams. Team building, okay. What else? Recognition, I love that one. What kind of recognition? Recognition of what you're doing, recognition of what you stand for. I love this one because this one is deep and this is the need. These are the type of needs that then become non-negotiables, right? Because if your need is recognition and you can't get recognition from the deal you're about to negotiate, that's where you walk away. What else do startups have as needs when they're negotiating? So to analyze the situation. Mm -hmm. Referrals, yeah, so that can be the network or referrals as a standalone. Anything else? Legacy, beautiful, I love it. Respect and trust. Wow, now we're talking. Anything else? A clear indication of whether you should continue or not, so whether you should waste your time on them or whether you should walk away, the earlier the better. Okay, and what would that clear indication be for you? That's difficult because a lot of the times the investors don't want to put you down as well, so they'll say nice things, but then it just carries on and then nothing ever really comes through. Okay, so to know immediately what will make you continue with me and what will make you walk away. Yeah, excellent. You see the way we are changing already the mindset of we're here to talk about money? No, we're not here to talk about money. Some companies, they need the network, they need the address, they need the investor to open doors. Other companies say, I want mentorship to know what am I doing and is this the best way? We have vision, team building, recognition, referrals, legacy. There is so much more than money alone. And you want to find a partner who has the same needs. That's how we can connect, and that's how we can have a long-term vision, looking in the same direction, and going for success, all right? Now, let's hear from the investors. I saw there was a big group there. Tell me, gentlemen, 
when you are negotiating on that table, when you are negotiating with the company that you want to invest in, it's your money, what are you looking for? Passion. That's what you said, right? Yeah, beautiful. What else? Story. Integrity of the persons. Integrity, love it. Commitment. What else? Humility. Humility, wow. Any female investors here? I haven't heard from a woman yet. Are they going to make me money? Return on investment? Yes. Yep. Okay, so. Startups, read this list. This is what you want to know. This is what you want to add in your pitch. This is what you want to speak about when you're talking to investors. Yes, of course, they want to know your ID and how beautiful it is and how fantastic it is and that you're going to be the next WhatsApp bought by Facebook, of course. But this is what they're really looking for. It doesn't come from me. This is what they said. And you will stand out in your pitch if you talk their language. Does this make sense? When you're negotiating with somebody, even somebody that you hate, you know, sometimes I'm negotiating with somebody and I think they're a complete moron with what they're doing or what they're asking. It doesn't matter. I still have to speak their language to connect with them. Because what somebody believes is fair might not be what you think is fair. What somebody believes is honest might be very different from your view of honesty and trust, etc. So it doesn't matter really your beliefs and your wants and your asks. What you want to connect is your needs with their needs. That's when we move an uh, extremely competitive negotiation into a collaborative one. Because unfortunately, today, statistics, 90% of negotiations are competitive. 90%. I win, you lose. That type of strategy and a lot of nonsense that we've been taught in negotiation books about how competitive it should be and how you can win and how you can ask for more and blah, blah, blah. No. In this type of negotiation, you can't afford to make it competitive because you're going to negotiate with somebody that you're going to partner up with that you're going to have to work with, that you're going to have to collaborate with, that you're going to have to have an exit strategy negotiation with. So it has to be collaborative. You don't have a choice. And if hostage negotiators can be collaborative with the hostage taker, I'm sure you can be collaborative with your investor. Right? I'm sure you can be collaborative with your startups. We don't have a choice. This has to be a collaborative one. So then how do you do it? How do you transform a competitive negotiation into a collaborative one? Obviously, we need the willingness to do it, but I'm going to share something that might sound very simple and yet is the massive game changer in every type of negotiation to put it from competitive into collaborative, to calm things down. And what's that? A common objective. You see, when you go into a startup pitch negotiation and you say, the company tells you, we are willing to give you 100K for 10% of your business. And you start there. That's the ask, remember? We don't negotiate on that. But that's what you do. No, that's ridiculous. If you want 10%, you need to give us 200K. Or for 100K, we'll give you 5%. Whatever it is. You're already starting to negotiate on the ask. Don't do it. Ask questions. Try to understand what is the common objective. Now, there are things like this. Companies are investing to make money. 
of course, but some are also investing to, I don't know, leave a legacy, make an impact, transmit their knowledge. That is what you want to connect on and then verbalize it, say it. Once you know what they want and that's what you want too, say it and keep repeating it during the negotiation. So it will sound something like this. Well, we both want this company to grow so that we both make an impact and we both earn money from it, right? How does that sound? It brings you into this collaborative mode of saying we have the same vision, we're going in the same direction, we want the same things. Now, how we're going to do it might be different, but that we're going to do it is the same line. And this obviously applies to any type of negotiation. When you start with a common objective, it calms things down, it calms people down. And that's when you can think in solutions instead of give, take, more, less, 0.1% uh, here, 0.1% there. What is the bigger vision? Why are we here? We're here because we both have the same goal and this is how we're going to do it. All right? So you've talked about your needs, you know why you're there, you make sure it's collaborative by verbalizing the common objective, you've studied your counterpart, you know what they want, you know what they need, you connect that with yours, then the next step is you're going to lead the negotiation. Now, how do you lead a negotiation? Imagine you see two people negotiate, but you don't speak their language. Or you see people negotiate, but you don't hear what they're saying. How do you know who's leading the negotiation? Body language, yeah. Who leads the negotiation? Because you want to lead the negotiation, right? Sound? Volume? Listen? Yes. Who listens? Exactly. So who is leading a negotiation, you think? The one who is talking a lot or the one who is listening a lot? Listening. Exactly. Exactly. Because when you listen, you get new intel. When you talk, you only say what you already know. And we want intel. We want to understand what matters to them. We want to understand how can we get this deal done. We want to understand how can I speak your language. And that only happens through the listening, to truly listening to what somebody is saying, because they will indicate to you what matters to them. They will indicate it with words, they will indicate it with body language, they will indicate it with pauses, they will indicate it with attention, they will indicate it by writing things down. Those are all elements that you can listen if you observe and you listen in 3D. What is being said? How is it being said? What is not being said? What is actually being meant? And you're looking for these things, for the need. Okay, because that's what we connect with. So listening is one of the most important elements in negotiations. Are you listening to the silence? That's another element. Don't be afraid of silences. Silence is golden. Once you've said what you had to say, Zip it. Most people are afraid of silences, so they will fill it up, and that will give you intel. All right? So listen. Listen. If you walk away from this and you only listen slightly better than you did before coming in, it's already going to have a massive difference. Then, the second element that is super important, that the FBI uses, so again, if they're doing it, we can do it too, and that is E for empathy. Don't underestimate the power of empathy, the power of wanting and being willing to understand the needs of the others, to try to see what matters to them, but also try to see how is somebody feeling, and then verbalize it. If you feel there is an elephant in the room, 
put it on the table. Empathy requires you to be so attentive to the other person that you can connect with them on a deeper human level and then verbalize it. If you see that somebody is really having difficulties, doesn't really believe in your business or has some other forms of concern, say it. It seems to me that you're not fully convinced yet. What is it that's bothering you? It seems to me that you still have some questions unanswered. What is it? That is empathy. Empathy is connecting with another human being to truly understand what matters to them. And when you see something, you put a label on it, you put it out there. Even if you're wrong, you know, it seems to me that I haven't fully earned your trust yet. No, that's not what I think. Boom, you have new intel and you know more than before labeling it. Okay? So empathy and putting words into what you believe you're observing. Now, how can you gain intel then? How can you know what they really believe? They're not going to tell it unless you ask. Ask good questions. Stop being focused on yourself, on your pitch, on your story, on your presentation, but ask what matters to you. So once you've done your beautiful pitch that you worked on for months, the slides are perfect, put it there and then ask. What is it that you like about what you saw? What is your number one concern? Make it about them. Let them talk. People have an inner need for recognition. People want to talk. If you create a safe space for people to talk, they will tell you more than you think. Okay? So listen, listen, listen. I believe there was a reason why God or the Creator made us with two ears and one mouth. Maybe if we would listen twice as much as we speak, we would have a better world. And that's me saying that as a speaker, yeah? Now, the last part on how you can lead a negotiation, and this might sound counterintuitive as well. Once you know exactly what they need, once you know what you need, then the, the intuitive response is to say, okay, this is what I propose, right? Sounds perfect, you just knock the ball in, because this is the right time. And that's where, again, I'm inviting you to do something counterintuitive, and that's to take a blank sheet and say, what type of solution do you see? How can we find a solution having said A, B, C, and D? Draft the solutions together. Not this is my idea, not this is what I propose, not let's do this. What do you think is the best way to move forward? And draw it together. Now, if you really become good at this and you know all the influence techniques, you will know how to let somebody have your way. <laughs> but before we all get there, it's important to draft the solutions together, to give the impression, at least, that the other party decided with you. You see, when we're called in to do a suicide negotiation, for example, we go on the roof of a company, somebody standing there wanting to commit suicide. As expert negotiators, we have the skills to convince them not to do it. And I would say it would take us about 15, 20 minutes. However, we stay there for at least an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours or longer. Why? We're not paid by the hour, that's not the reason. so that they don't do it again. Exactly. Negotiation, ladies and gentlemen, is not about convincing. Negotiation is not about being right. A good negotiator tries to influence. You want somebody to believe that they came up with the solution because this is what's best for them. You want to make this about them. A successful negotiation is where everybody leaves thinking it was a success. If you believe it was a success, your counterpart thinks you're an asshole, you're not going to go very far. Okay? 
And then the last part, I can give you a thousand skills and techniques and tools that we all use, but the main part is self-control. This is going to be a negotiation where you are going to be personally involved. This is going to be about your company. This is going to be about your money. And you're going to invest your time, your energy, your livelihood. So whether you want it or not, you're going to be emotionally involved. You're going to be personally involved. And that is a very difficult situation to negotiate in. And with all the tools that you have, the number one skill you'll also need is self-control. Controlling yourself controlling your ego that comes with you wherever you go. Keep your ego in check. Okay? As I always say, great negotiators know how to know ego shit. Now, how can you recognize your ego? Start, start recognizing it and start talking to it. Oh, ego, there you are. I can handle this. Oh, that's an ego response. Calm down. Nobody wants to work with somebody who is arrogant. Nobody wants to work with somebody who has an ego like this. Do you? Nobody does. So don't be that person. Check your ego. Check yourself. Now, where are we with this fear for negotiation right now? I hope what I've shared with you today helps you to shine another light on negotiation. And negotiation is a simple tool. Well, there's nothing simple about it, but it's only a tool to go from a disagreement to an agreement. Negotiation is a way to resolve conflict. We don't agree on something, we're going to work together to move towards an agreement where we do agree. Okay? Now, having said that, and having shared some skills that we all uh, use in the professional negotiation world, has this helped you look at negotiation slightly differently? Yes or no? If it's yes, raise your hand. Oh, look at that. Has that lowered the fear for negotiations? Yes? Okay. As I said in the beginning, I truly, truly believe that the world becomes a better place when we negotiate better. Just think about it for a second. How many wars could have been prevented if our world leaders negotiated better? How many wars could we end faster if we negotiated better? How many day-to-day -day conflicts that we all have can be resolved faster and better if we negotiate better? With more collaboration and less competitiveness, with more integrity and less ego. Now, this all boils down to finding this balance of confidence and humility. You want to have confidence in yourself, in your team, in your story, in your product, in your service, in your startup. We need confidence and we want you to show that. Not one investor will invest in you if you don't have confidence in yourself and in your story. But at the same time, you want the humility the humility of knowing we don't know it all, we do need money, we do need mentorship, we do need a network. And therefore, I believe this beautiful balance of confidence and humility will get you far in life. Now, if you had a fear of negotiations before, and if you don't now, or at least it's less, can you please stand up? Can you please stand up if you're joining me on this mission of making the world a better place through negotiation? If you think, you know what, this makes sense, I will do my best to negotiate better. Beautiful. I love to see this. This is wonderful. I want to leave you with this, a beautiful quote from John F. Kennedy, who said, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please say a, a big round of applause for Lucid. We do have 
a very short amount of time for questions. So again, my WhatsApp number, if you've already got it, 058-175-9604, and the phone is already buzzing. You talk about need, but what about greed? How do you counter that? Good question. Thank yeah, great question. I love that. Thank you, Junaid. So greed is, of course, part of human nature, and greed is going to be part of the negotiation table. And you can't control the greed of your counterpart. What you can control is your own greed. So have a look at it, just like everything else you're preparing. Is this my ego talking? Is this greed talking? Or is this a real need? A successful negotiation is where you can satisfy your need, not your ego. If you can satisfy your need, that is when you have a successful negotiation, and that is the time to say, thank you. Let's agree. Let's sign the contract. Let's move forward. Negotiation is not a game. We've been taught that win, lose, more or less. Negotiation is to come to an agreement. And if your focus is on the agreement, if your focus is on the long term, and if you want to understand your counterpart, you need to understand what they need, and then together go and satisfy that need. Question from Kevin, uh, which is, what cultural differences have you seen in negotiations? Does that matter? Cultural differences, yes, very good question as well. There are, of course, some cultural differences, but that is main into how you approach somebody. So when you look at different cultures, there are different codes that, of course, we need to respect, like how close do you come some, to somebody, when do you start talking about negotiations, you know, that you have the Scandinavian cultures and Europe who is more direct and goes, you know, get to business faster, and then you have cultures where first we're going to talk about family and other stuff, you have cultures where first you have to drink a lot of alcohol before you have the right to talk about business. That's important to know, and that's all part of homework. But when it boils down to pure negotiations, when it boils down to how am I going to understand what you want, when it boils down to how am I going to go from a disagreement to an agreement, you would be surprised that it's internationally the same thing. It's internationally. Everybody on earth, doesn't matter where you were born, wants to be listened to. Everybody on earth wants to be treated with respect. Everybody on Earth has some level of need for recognition. So if you connect from human to human, you get rid of the titles and the beautiful background and the beautiful look at me, you connect from human to human, and you have this vision of going in the same direction, that's when you make magic happen. A uh, kind of connected question here from David. Thanks, David. Um, how important is it to be likable? Oh, likable. It's extremely important. That's also a beautiful question. Thank you for asking, David. Um, I, I, I did a podcast episode on life negotiations with Gary Nesner. Gary Nesner is an amazing uh, former FBI hostage negotiator. He was the boss of Chris Voss. They collaborated together. And these two gentlemen have shared so much on the FBI method. And he talks about likability as one of the key elements. You want to make the other person want to talk to you. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be best friends. Remember, again, they're negotiating with hostage takers. But you want to be likable, because that's what will allow you to gain intel and to let somebody talk to you. And something beautiful that he said is, we need to earn the right to influence need to earn the right to influence, and that starts by being likable. So, question from me. If you're sat across the table from the party you're negotiating with, and the response you're getting back is no, 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 I'm thinking Mrs. Armstrong when I'm asking for a boy's night out, how do I get past that? Yeah, so how do you get past the no, no, no? Again, lead. First of all, don't be impressed by the no. It's just, doesn't matter. And then lead, listen. What is it that you're saying no to, really? What matters to you in this moment? What makes you say no now? What is missing to get to yes? Ask. So the same thing. Listen, ask questions, draft solutions together, etc. Make them comfortable to talk to you. Lucin, thank you very much. I can see that time is against us, unfortunately. But one last round of applause. I think that's been an excellent morning session, both for Jenny and Marwan so and much. for Lucin. Thank you very much.